Okay. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to Tech Growth UK presentation, part of London Tech Week 2021. My name is Amy Davies and I'm Head of Technology for the Department for International Trade's Investment Services team. It's an absolute pleasure to be here today to open up this session, which will give you a great insight into why you would why you should bring your business to the UK and how to do it. So if you're looking for a great country to expand your business, develop and launch new products and services and sell them internationally, you've come to the right place today. Today's trial session will begin with myself giving you an overview of the UK's abundance of exciting market opportunities and the government support offering that enables you to get set up in the UK and leverage all of those opportunities for your business. After me, we'll hear from three of our commercial partners, Joanna Dodd of Rochester PR Group, who will be talking about how to raise your profile in the UK, James Blakemore of the JMB Partnership, who will talk you through his top tips for selling in the UK, and finally, Alex Lloyd from Burgess Salmon, who will be talking you through how to set up a UK entity. Following on from them, we'll have a talk from Justin McRae, Chief Operations Officer of Fortunus Capital, who will be talking you through what a venture capital fund looks for. Up next will be Chris Moore, one of our tech sector specialists, who will be talking to four companies who've already been supported by my team to get set up and launch in the UK. And for the final part of our session, we'll head back to Justin, where he'll be facilitating a panel discussion with three other VC fund managers who will be answering some pertinent questions about their funds and how to access them. So before we get started, a little bit of housekeeping. You can ask questions by clicking the Q&A button located on your Zoom toolbar, and you can show your support for other people's questions by giving them the thumbs up. If you're experiencing any technical issues, can you please contact our moderator using the chat moderator at the chat box also on the toolbar at the bottom. Okay, so we're keen to talk a little bit about our, our audience today and to do that we're going to pop up a poll and uh, we'd like to know what country you're dialing in from, what type of tech company you have and what stage of entering the UK market you are right now. You should be able to see the poll on your screen if you can participate. Now that'd be great. Fantastic. Hopefully that's given everybody long enough to answer. So let's get to the important stuff. I'm going to share my screen. Can everybody see that? Fantastic. So why the UK? Well, the UK has the fifth largest economy in the world and a huge addressable market of early adopters. And due to an increase in demand for digital services to power working from home due to COVID related lockdowns, there's, the market's seen a huge surge in demand for technologies that enable, secure and facilitate working from home. And this has significantly increased the value of our digital economy and accelerated the adoption of emerging digital technologies. When comparing the UK to other EU destinations, the UK saw $15 billion worth of venture capital funds invested in businesses trading in the UK in 2020. That's more than France and Germany combined. And in fact, in a, new, um, a new report launched yesterday by a tech nation, looking at the first half of 2021, we'd already increased um, investment in tech businesses up to $18 billion, which is just fantastic. Uh, we also have the highest number of tech unicorns anywhere in Europe, along with, with exceptional talent and an exceptional talent pipeline. So why is the UK the destination for choice for so many international tech businesses? 
Well, we've got a really well-established ecosystem that offers an array of support services that support our tech community to operate, thrive and develop in the UK. Since leaving the EU, we've got a trade cooperation deal with 20, the 27 EU member states and 68 free trade agreements with more in negotiation, making the UK a great place to trade internationally from. Looking at the tech scene in a bit more detail, I thought I'd use artificial intelligence as an example because it's ubiquitous throughout the technology landscape today. And you can see from the slides that the ecosystem is already supporting 1300 AI businesses and that by 2035, those businesses, along with businesses like yours, will add 654 billion to the UK economy, economy which is a huge opportunity for any tech business. To accommodate this, the government has committed a huge sum of money through the AI sector deal. And the deal centers on the five, on five foundations of ideas, people, infrastructure, business, environment and places to enhance productivity and ensure the flourishing of AI businesses at their crucial embryonic stage. So how can the UK government help you to bring your business to the UK? Well, once you've made an inquiry through your local DIT office, which is located at your British embassy or consulate, you'll be allocated a dedicated, dedicated account manager uh, from my team who will work really, really closely with a colleague in the embassy who understand your business requirements and aspirations. They'll offer hands-on support throughout the whole process, uh, give you lots of different information to help you make the right decisions about where to locate your business in the UK and facilitate connections to the right people to get you set up here. But it doesn't end there. We've got colleagues and commercial partners throughout the UK that will always be on hand no matter what stage of your business. Um, and we also have a large team of international trade advisors who will help you to export your products and services around the world when you're ready. So let's drill that down to a little bit more detail for you. So the UK has a wide variety of funding routes, including angel and VC investment networks, grants and debt funding, which we can signpost you to. We also have a wider ecosystem that supports businesses of any size in every technology subsector to enable and enhance your UK growth. We can also help you to find and meet with potential customers via our array of trade shows and associations. And we can also introduce you to commercial partners via our investment support directory that can assist with crucial business activities like lead generation and business development. A great example of which uh, is James Bickmore from JMB Group We'll be talking to you on this topic shortly. We also have a great selection of accelerator programs in London and across all of UK regions. Um, they are well established and offer hands on support to get your businesses to the next level. We have some that are backed by corporates and some of them offer grant funding too. So once you're ready to go in the UK, we can help you to leverage relationships with uh, talents and skill services, universities and colleges to help you find the right, the right talent for your business right now, but also to help you develop a talent pipeline for the future. And um, there's been a significant increase in courses throughout the UK to make sure that we're developing that skills pool and um, make sure we've got a strong talent pool for the future of tech in the UK. Beyond that, we can provide you with information about programs, collaborations and funding to inspire, support and deliver your R&D ambitions. And we have some amazing tax incentives for businesses that um, develop and manufacture products in the UK. If you haven't considered your next R&D steps, don't worry, we're frequently releasing challenges to the market to help us drive the UK economy to become the best digitally enabled and green ecosystem in the world. So a short and sweet overview, but I hope that's given you a really good insight into why the UK and how we support you to land here. Thank you very much for your time. And without further ado, I will hand over to our, for, to our commercial partners, Joanna Dodd, James Blakemore and Alex Lloyd. Thank you very much. Thanks, Amy. Thanks very much. Um, so good morning, everybody. Well, good morning here in the UK. Um, and great to have you all with us today. 
Um, Amy's just shared some really compelling reasons why the UK is a great place to land and grow your tech business. And my very short talk is going to really be about convincing you that one of your key jobs is to promote, publicize and market your company to let people know you are here. And why is that? Well, because in our experience, the brands and companies that are well connected, networked with the right people, those who establish and then manage their reputations, who share interesting content and engage with their customers or consumers, depending on the type of tech, give themselves a much, much better chance of being successful in the short term. And short term success, whether that's gaining traction and sales or generating partnerships, really helps your business with a chance of being successful in the longer term. So why can I tell you this? Well, it's, this is because it's the type of work that my company does. It's all geared around UK market entry, launching companies in the UK, and that's all that we do. We work across a widespread of industry sectors, but key, key specialization is tech. And we work across tech companies, both B2C, B2B, in many different vertical sectors. Um, we, our clients come from all over the world, so we have a unique and privileged position of seeing companies from around the world when they land in the UK. And the sort of work we do is incredibly varied. It can be creating the networks that lead to sales. It can be producing collateral for clients, running media relations campaigns, targeting influencers and opinion formers, social media programs, to name just a few. So why do you need a profile to be successful in the UK? It's tempting to think that after deciding on the UK market and all the work that entails months, sometimes years, then sorting out, you've got to sort out your visas, offices, people, bank accounts, you're all sorted and ready to go. And often, to be honest, marketing your company is well down your list of priorities. But it really shouldn't be. It's pretty essential that you get yourself known and understood so that people know why they want to buy from you. You need to manage your company and brand's reputation. Otherwise, you're just another company with your fingers crossed, hoping to be discovered. And that is going to be very challenging in the UK market. The UK is a fantastic, but it's also a competitive market. And one of the key things that founders tell us is that it always took longer than they were expecting to get those first customers or generate those first sales. And that some of their competitors who really don't have such a great solution seem to be doing better. And yes, to be honest, that means they are investing their time and money in their marketing activity to get those messages across to help their sales or their sales teams. So let me give you a quick few thoughts on how you should approach your launch in the UK. Firstly, really make sure you understand the opportunity for your company. Get to know your market here because each market has a rhythm of its own. Do you know it? What are the key dates and times of the year, the key opinion formers, the key events? In more detail, get to know your competition and the vertical sector or sectors you could be targeting. You know, is it busy? Lots going on? Are there lots of other companies or brands competing for attention? And how are they positioning themselves and what are they doing? Is it a case that you need to be seen in the same places as them or could you stand out by doing something very different? And then next, work out why the UK market is going to want to hear from you. How are you relevant and who is going to be most interested in your brand or service? What problem do you solve? And do you have something genuinely new to say or offer? So rather than repeat what you know you do, look at what the market needs and make sure it is really clear how you fit in. So sometimes, for example, that can mean targeting a smaller, easier sector to begin with to give you UK credibility rather than targeting a huge sector where you could find it is going to eat up your time and money. Then take a good, long, hard look at your collateral. Review what sort of content you used and what works in your home territory. Research, white papers, collaborations, opinion pieces, and ask yourself whether any of this content could work for the UK. Get a UK native's opinion on your website, for example. Will its style and use of language resonate with a UK audience? And then consider all the different media options you've got for sharing the content. So we work across paid, owned, earned and shared. So paid is anything you pay for, owned is the content you have, the collateral I just mentioned, Earned is where PR really is, where you get your influence engagement or journalists writing about your company. And shared is very much where social media, for example, sits. So what to do next? Perhaps obvious from what I've said earlier, but the starting point is to do something. You don't want to achieve the status being best kept secret. People need to know you. And obviously what you do is going to be determined by how much resource you can throw at it in terms of time and money. But whatever that is, do something. 
activate a plan, set some objectives so you can decide whether your activity has been successful. And then choose the right combination of PR marketing activity, the elements that will give you the greatest return and greatest chance of being successful in the UK in the short term. Don't stubbornly stick to what works at home if others, customers, consumers, local professionals are telling you to think differently in the UK. If you trust them, trust their advice. And some other quick points, don't overstretch yourself, don't overpromise. be authentic, honest and transparent. If you're not the leading Y or the most innovative X, don't say you are. People will always remember if you've overclaimed. And then finally, I'd say be adaptable. Almost all our clients find they change their approach and plans as they take on board learnings from the UK. So thank you for listening. Hope I've given you some food for thought about why you should build a profile for your brand and your company as quickly as possible in the UK. And I'm gonna hand over to James Blakemore to talk about sales and lead generation. Thanks, Joanna. Um, great to see so many companies interested in the UK market here today. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some tips for selling in the UK market. First of all, just to give a bit of context uh, as to why we're able to give that advice. Um, I set up a business 15 years ago, working with international businesses, helping them to sell into the UK market. We work um, with we work with over a thousand international companies in that time, We're all about finding first customers and seeing opportunities in the UK. Uh, as Joanna said, the UK is a great market, but also very competitive. Um, there are some things there that can help you at an early stage, but also when you're more established here in the UK. So the, the five tips I'm going to run through um, are, are some just some guides, really, as to some of the things you can do. Um, obviously, the, the most a lot the most important thing is research. So when first looking at the UK market, understanding who are your competitors, what are the risks to your your business, how do you how you're going to stand out. Um, how are you really going to uh, establish a market presence um, uh, here in the UK? So things like SWOT analysis, uh, understanding where those opportunities might be is, is going to be really important. So do your research and understand where your opportunities are. Uh, next is data. So with any lead gen or marketing campaign, understanding who your clients and your audience is, is, is going to be incredibly important. Um, so really take some time, understand who your existing clients are in your uh, existing markets, understand um, are they large companies, are they small companies, um, are they growing companies, these types of things that can be really important. Obviously sectors that you're working in, the sort of buying personas of your uh, decision makers you're looking to reach out to is incredibly important. Um, and there's some great tools that enable you to get very accurate, consistent data that, that will um, speed the process up. I think one of the misconceptions um, when companies look at the UK market is actually let's get a database of, of 5,000 companies and send emails to them and start that approach, which is, which is one way of doing it. But what we found over the years is that having a really targeted database, even if it's just three to 400 contacts, in, in some cases we have clients who have a very small uh, potential uh, client base um, and, and it may be 50 records but the benefit of a slightly smaller uh, data set is that you can be more personalized you can send uh, understand where businesses are in their current uh, working practices are there current things they're talking about as a business they're looking to get into that that fits with your product or service um, so really do that again building on that research find and build a database of, of really qualified prospects that can be your first customers in the UK um, also think local. So obviously, if you're going up against uh, UK businesses and you have a you know, similar um, technology or similar product, um, you have to really show the market that you're, you're serious. So one of the, the big challenges companies face is when they're first exploring the market is, is sometimes they can go a bit half hearted. So they can put a bit of effort in, but don't really go for the full approach. Where sometimes if you say to the market that you're serious, and as an example, get a UK office, uh, UK telephone number, um, show that you have that local presence. It's going to be really important. And there's some really very cost effective routes to, to be able to show that presence. And obviously at a later stage, um, looking to set up a limited company and having a, a, UK, uh, a UK base. Um, a, a good cost effective um, way of generating leads is LinkedIn. Again, nothing that's a revolution, what we're saying, uh, or, or anything that uh, um, isn't rocket science. Um, but LinkedIn is really, really a, a fantastic tool uh, of building you know, through Sales Navigator, building those contacts, keeping track of when someone maybe moves businesses that might prove an opportunity for you, um, but, but also getting that direct uh, messaging opportunity. With, with COVID, um, obviously a lot of professionals are working 
from home still. And so it's very hard to contact them through switchboards, through telephone systems. So utilizing LinkedIn to get those direct messages is, is a good way of, of, of getting your, your product or service in front of them. Um, and lastly, I'm just going to talk about recruiting. Um, you know, we've seen time and time again where companies have struggled with sales is that they may be recruited to somebody that's a friend of a friend who happens to be living in the UK rather than look at someone who has that experience in the sector that they're looking to, to work in. Um, so you may pay a bit more, maybe 25, 30% more in terms of um, staff wages and, and, and recruitment costs, but actually um, look at who's working for your competitors, who has experience at the market, who already has those contacts. And that can be a very, very good way of speeding up the sales process when entering the UK. Um, thanks for your time. I'd like to hand over to Alex Lloyd from Burgess Summit. Hi everyone, I'm Alex. I'm a corporate finance director at Burgess Salmon, which is a law firm. I'll get into it quickly, but just a quick bit about us. So if you look at our current roster of overseas clients looking to establish in the UK, we've got clients from the US, Germany, Singapore, Sweden, Russia, et cetera, et cetera. And that's a mixture of fintechs, health tech businesses. At the moment we've got a real estate finance platform, some VR gaming. So all sorts, some of those have come through our relationships with the DIT, others from outside. And we are doing everything from helping them incorporate in the first place through to complex regulatory advice, if it's financial services business, say, or whatever sector they're in, you know, employment, incentives, IP, et cetera, et cetera. So we're doing a lot of this kind of stuff with businesses just like yours. As I say, we've got five minutes. So I thought what I'd do is, is concentrate on a decision that anyone looking to establish in the UK would be thinking about. And the question we're looking at is, is it, is it better to incorporate a private limited company in the UK, so a subsidiary in the UK, an actual legal entity, or set up a UK establishment, more commonly known as a branch, and that's an extension of a non-UK entity. There are other ways you might do it. There are agency arrangements, you might set up distributor arrangements, partnerships and franchises, but we're going to look at that core question, incorporate or not. So why might you incorporate a private limited company in the UK? It doesn't have to be that kind of entity, by the way, but I'm talking about private limited companies here because that's the most common type of vehicle. The most obvious reason is that that company has its own legal personality. It's a separate entity. It can contract on its own terms and its own right. And therefore, theoretically at least, your liabilities in the UK will be ring-fenced in that corporate vehicle. Of course, people might ask for support from the overseas entity in the form of a guarantee or something. But generally, you've got a separate entity able to contract and its, its liabilities are ring fenced. It's really cheap and it's easy to set up and incorporate. We're talking less than 500 pounds and it, once you've collected the data and the information you need, you can do it in 24 to 48 hours. So that's easy. When you're dealing with your counterparties as well, you, you know, customers, landlords, banks, whoever, they'll clearly be used to dealing with UK private limited companies. They'll be able to look them up on the company's house, which is the public register in the UK. And depending on how well capitalized they are, they'll be, and if they've got substance at least, they'll be, they'll be um, very useful. They might make your dealings with counterparties easier. Disadvantages, you open yourself up to a slightly broader regulatory regime, of course. For example, the directors of that UK company will be subject to UK directors' duties. You'll also have a, an increased administration and filing requirements. You'll need to make regular filings with companies house. You'll need to do that if you operate through a branch anyway, but they're slightly enhanced if you incorporate. Lastly, if you when you come to if, if it goes wrong and you've got to wind up that company, you've got a formal legal entity and you need to go through a formal wind up process. Next, if we look at establishing a branch, this is not setting up a separate entity. This is um, operating as an extension of your non UK business. Advantages, well, it's limited upfront time commitment, and it gives you the maximum amount of flexibility as a sort of first step into the market. And if, if it goes wrong, it's quicker and easier to wind it up. Disadvantages, well, it's, it's the converse of the other one. You don't get to ring fence your UK liabilities, and you don't have a separate UK entity to contract on its own terms. You still have some registration and ongoing compliance requirements. You still have to make some filings. And lastly, we can't get into any of the nuance of the tax situation, but the you're going to be paying corporation, UK corporation taxes, whether you're a branch or uh, whether you've established a subsidiary, making your computations for those tax returns might be easier if you've got a subsidiary or a branch. 
Next, I'm just very quickly going to make two points on practical things because we see clients make mistakes on both of these quite regularly. So visas, first of all, there's lots of different categories of visa. You might be looking at a startup visa, an innovative visa, et cetera, et cetera. And all I want to say really is think about the process and start it early because the chronology makes a difference and you want to be, you don't want to make a technical mistake with the form and you don't want to be applying for the wrong category of visa. Second, bank accounts. I know this is boring and administrative, but same again, there's no standardized process for opening a bank account across the bank. So think about the documents you're gonna need. Do they need to be apostilled or notarized? Same deal, think about it early and start, start work on the process as soon as you can. I'll leave you very quickly with two of our initiatives which might, might be of help to you. So we've got a UK investment launch pad that is a full service to help you set up in the UK. It's lawyers and it's also a project management advice for a fixed fee. So that's a sort of get you started and incorporate in the UK. And secondly, we're launching a new product on the 4th of October called Bscale. That's about assisting tech startups and scale-ups. It's free access to a suite of automated legal documents, including for a very early stage fundraising. And we've got a pricing model and staffing model, which is all about bridging the gap between the need for advice for a tech startup and, and the financial resources available. So that's me. Thank you very much. I'll hand it back over to Amy now. Great. Thanks very much. That was really interesting. Uh, and it seemed like the key highlights there were do your research before you get here, identify the gaps in the market so you can clearly define your audience. Um, to enable you to really specifically target them to gain traction as quickly as possible. Uh, start early when you're looking at visas and bank, uh, banking facilities to make sure that the process uh, can happen as quickly as possible. Um, we're going to go to Chris Moore now, who's going to address your questions in the Q&A for each of the speakers. Chris. Thanks, Amy. Uh, and we've just got a few minutes, so we'll, we'll just do a few of the questions. Um, the first one is actually for you, Amy. Um, if a company is thinking about uh, probing the UK market and wants to get some insight into the, the market, can you provide help with market research and understanding how to navigate the market? Yeah, well, the, we have um, a team of highly experienced project managers. Uh, there are four within our team, and they've been doing this job for years, and they know the UK market. Um, really, really well. Um, you know, they 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 work with um, hundreds of companies, understanding their needs, and they can help to one. They can help to give you the information that you need across the breadth of the spectrum. You know, from you know, you know, what's your budget to get set up in the UK? Where's the best place to get set up in terms of you know, what's the ecosystem that will support their particular subsector? You know, what's the cost of living, and thus what wages will they need to pay? Um, but they also have a really good understanding of, 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 the, um, of the demand for certain subsectors. That's great, Amy. Thank you. Uh, next question is for Alex. Um, Alex, you, you just went through a lot of detail very quickly, and um, I think companies recognize that it is quite complicated to navigate this environment to work out what is the right kind of entity. So if they're thinking about coming to the UK, at what point should they be getting in touch with you? Um, how, how far along do they need to be in their, in their thought process? I would get in touch as early as you possibly can for a number of reasons, because you, you, you need to think about your tax structure, and that could be relatively complicated. You need to think about your visa applications, which categories are you going to go for? You need to get in place all the boring stuff about bank accounts and payroll and all of that stuff. All of it takes longer than you think. So I would do it early, very early is, is the best point. And, and you know, you're not going to be wasting anyone's time if you have an initial consultation and, and just set out a real detailed steps plan. So yeah, I would do it and do it, do it as soon as you can. That's great, Alex. So I expect you'll be getting some uh, contacts uh, reaching out to you quite soon. Thank you. Um, just just moving to James then. Um, James, you, you, you talked a lot about how you can help businesses to to expand their 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 client base in the UK. Again, um, some of those companies may think, well, the UK is quite far away for us. We, we're not ready to move yet. Um, so to what degree can you help them to get started with clients before they actually arrive? Yeah, it's, it's about building a sales pipeline, a, a database of, of organizations, um, but also enable them to do the research. Is, is the UK going to be a market for them? So by, by undertaking that work and having um, live conversations with prospects, um, that's the best form of validation. Um, what I would say, you, you do need to still think about how 
you're going to come across to prospects. So by having a UK address, having a UK telephone number will actually help you get a better response in that initial phase. Um, so I think as soon as you can, and obviously when um, COVID, uh, hopefully uh, things improve, um, then you know, get, oh, my biggest advice is get on a plane, come to the UK, meet with people and, and, and build relationships, network, 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 um, and, and explore the opportunities. But yeah, the early, the early work is so important to validate the market for you. Oops. Thanks, James. Um, and last quick question for Joanna. Um, again, similar kind of territory. The uh, companies often leave the, the engagement on PR and their, their identity and engaging with the with kind of customers and, and raising their profile until a bit too late. Again, can they do things before they actually arrive? Yeah, I mean, very similar to what Alex and James are saying. Absolutely. I mean, we, we when we talk about market entry, that can be for anybody looking at the UK, you know, maybe a year out. Um, and, and just wanting to get everything ready to those that are here and, and need to launch. But um, yeah, it's really important to start early. I'm, I'm just really repeating what everyone's saying, start early because, you know, sort of when you work with a client and you're just about to launch them and actually their website's not right for the UK market, um, it makes a big difference. It's all about, you know, trust and building up those relationships here. So you don't want anything that's going to detract from, you know, when you start engaging with people, they're immediately going to look you up on, Google and find you on LinkedIn and anything that's just jarring or wrong is really not going to help you. So, so start early, absolutely. Thanks, Joanna. And I think that's all the time we've got for these first quick questions. So I'm gonna pass back to Amy, thank you. Great, thanks very much. So to the next part of the session, uh, I'm gonna introduce uh, Justin from Fortunus Venture Capital, and then he'll be handing over to Chris Moore for the panel discussion with some tech businesses that we've already supported to land in the UK. Justin. Thank you, Amy, and a big welcome to everyone at the Tech Week. Um, my name is Justin McRae. Um, I represent the, as the Chief Operations Officer for Fortunus Capital, which is invested in by the McRae family office. Um, again, welcome. Uh, fantastic week. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, DIT. Um, who am I? Just explain, Chief Operations Officer. It's my job to find the best opportunities in the world to invest in in the tech space. So pretty relevant while I'm here. Um, <clears throat> give you a bit, bit more of an idea about us and about where we sit in this space. Our mission is to seek out and find the best tech to invest in from around the world, bring that to the UK and develop it and then expand it out around the rest of the globe. So <clears throat> I'm excited to be here and I hope you are as well. Today, I'm gonna to talk about a couple of things which are a bit more lower level. Um, you've heard some great strategic advice. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna start off again um, with why tech? Why do we invest in tech? Today, uh, we're facing a large number of problems in our society, in our environment, <clears throat> and an increasing number of challenges. How do we solve that? Well, through tech, through science, through intelligence. And now, more than any time in the world, we have the ability to solve these problems through tech-based solutions. What does that actually represent for our society, for our environment, and for investors, it represents an enormous commercial opportunity that can actually be positive and solve these problems. So for the first time in the world, uh, in, in our history, we believe we've entered into an age of innovation where tech can solve our global problems. And that brings an element of commerciality on a scale that's hardly been seen before. So <clears throat> that's why we're in the space. I know why you're in it. Um, let me tell you a little bit about what we look for when we look to invest in tech. <clears throat> Firstly, we want the most amazing teams or the most amazing founders. We want people who are so committed that this is their life's work. Because trust me, when you go down a venture capital journey, you have to be so committed to achieving that journey. You will be working 
three, four, five years, morning, afternoon, night, forget holidays, and your investors will want to see that commitment from you because you've got a long way to go, but I can at least tell you that the journey is a hugely enjoyable one if you're committed. So firstly, you have to have that commitment. This is just not just a business you to come and bring to the UK. This is a, a way of life. And you're talking about venture capital and investment and tech-based solutions. That's the starting point. Now, your idea, uh, what we look for, what everyone looks for clearly has to be commercially viable. So it has to make money, not on day one, not on day two or even day five or year five, but it's got to make money. It's got to show value and how it's going to produce revenues. And that commerciality has to be scalable. So once you've got past your first uh, setup phase, which the guys have spoken about, you're going out to market, you're competing, um, you need to be able to scale globally. And that's certainly what we would look for in an opportunity because global scalability equals commerciality, which equals a higher sales price, which is pretty simple. Um, secondly, you need to have innovation. We don't want to see the same idea. We want something that's different that can stand up and be counted by itself uh, and compete as a standalone innovation. And right now in the age of innovation, you can achieve that through tech and science much easier than people could 20, 30 years ago. So, you know, you're at the right time uh, now. One of the last things we want to see is solving a problem. Um, we are an impact investor, but it doesn't mean we don't like to make money. We do, um, as all investors do. But if you're solving a problem, generally that means that you're more scalable. Um, and generally that means that the uptake to your tech is going to be higher by society. So for example, we have fintechs that solve debt problems, which you know, in this day and age, a lot of people are facing. We have biotechs that are solving really uh, prominent health problems. So if you're solving problems, you're generally gonna be more successful as opposed to standing alone. I think you know the one thing that I'll pass on uh, coming up to the end of my time talking to you guys in this 10 minutes block is that you need to be resourceful. Too often when we invest into a client, we see people or, or founders looking to burn cash, the cash burn as a way of solving problems. Um, for us, be resourceful, go out and hustle, get deals. Um, don't use cash as your only resource for advancing your tech and being successful. Um, work those longer hours, ask for favors. The UK government, for example, is here to support. The UK is the premier destination for tech in the world. It has got the largest um, access to capital base to get investment in the entire uh, Western Europe. In fact, this, this side of the world. Um, and it's had that title of having the largest investments for 23 years running. Um, you know, the government of the UK offers grants, research and development uh, tax credits. There's huge uh, incentives to set up here and be successful. So you, you really do have support of UK government. And the UK, one of the biggest things you probably need to look for as a, one final piece of advice is that our talent pool is enormous in UK for hiring. And it's there for a reason. So you can find the best people here. I think uh, finally, I wish you all good luck. Um, I hope to see you sometime in the future and I'll hand back to Amy, thank you. Thanks very much, Justin. Uh, we are going to go to Chris Moore. Chris Moore. Thanks. Thanks, Amy, and uh, good to be talking to you this morning or this afternoon, wherever you are around the world. Uh, just to complete the introductions, uh, I'm a technology specialist working for the Department for International Trade, supporting companies that are looking to set up in the UK for the first time or to expand their existing business. So I work very closely with Amy and her team. 
Um, so uh, before we get on to the panel, uh, and I, I wanted to say thank you very much to Justin for giving us some tremendous uh, advice, uh, which I'm sure everybody will really appreciate going forward. We did a poll earlier. I now wanted to just quickly run through the results of the poll. Um, and one, the first question was really about status of, of where you are in the process in terms of thinking about the UK. And more than 50% uh, were actively thinking about uh, coming to the UK. Uh, about 40% were very early still in that process. And in terms of the raising funding, well, the majority, about 60% of people are uh, around the seed stage, uh, with perhaps around 30% at Series A and a few others at other points. Uh, and then thinking about the spread of technologies, well, we've got quite a spread uh, today. Uh, the majority just slightly in software as a service, but at around 40%, but then a similar uh, split between fintech, AI, and uh, other technology areas. And finally, in terms of looking at the enthusiasm, the optimism for, for coming to the UK, uh, I'm pleased to say that the majority were very enthusiastic about uh, coming to the UK, so more than 60%. Um, about a third uh, were the kind of next stage down, you know, quite quite optimistic, but not quite there yet. And finally, uh, the the remainder were were not quite at that point yet. Okay, without further ado, I now wanted to bring in the panel. Uh, we have got a fantastic lineup today, and uh, in no particular order. Uh, could I ask each of the panelists to introduce themselves and uh, to just spend just a couple of minutes uh, uh, explaining a little bit about their company, uh, where you are in terms of your UK uh, journey, and also what, what you're planning to do in the future, but just in a couple of minutes. Akash, can we, can we, uh, nice to see you, and can we, uh, can we uh, start with you, please? Yes, uh, thanks a lot, Chris. It's great to see you. Uh, I'm Akash Naidu, uh, co-founder and CEO uh, of the Startupreneur. Uh, we are trying to uh, build an end-to-end -end digital ecosystem to support entrepreneurs, uh, startups, and small businesses. Uh, we, we began uh, our journey in 2019. Uh, we started off in India, but we expanded to the UK. And uh, now we are seeing a kind of a global uh, market uh, from, from the vantage point of UK. Uh, so, so yeah, I think uh, the, the, the vision for us uh, is for entrepreneurs uh, and businesses uh, to be able to build and scale their ventures uh, on our using our platform. Uh, so, so thank you very much, Chris, uh, for the opportunity. Thanks, Akash. Uh, can we move to Jim, please? Thanks, Chris. Good morning uh, and early good morning to all of you from Canada. Uh, I'm Jim Gassel, co-founder of Trophio. Uh, originally based here in Canada, we set up our group in the UK in 2019. We're all remote with a team of about eight people at the moment. My co-founder is based in uh, London and has been for the past 18 months. Trifio is a legal tech platform and it relates to my work as a registered patent agent or what you might call a patent or, or IP attorney in the UK. Um, uh, it is a team-based client viability tool for IP attorneys and law firms. Uh, we help attorneys filter and begin educating their inbound prospects all before having to invest any business development time. Uh, it is a particularly uh, a challenging part of the patent profession to uh, introduce uh, new prospects to a firm. It's a particularly challenging uh, task because of the nature of the work that we do and the kind of clients that we really need to attract. And, and often we're doing it in an ad hoc way uh, that, that follows a gut feel after a meeting and, and several emails. Uh, currently we are pre-release. Uh, we will be starting to onboard our first users this fall. Uh, in 2022, uh, we'll be scaling in the UK as well as some other global markets. I'm delighted to be here and happy to uh, participate in, uh, in the, the panel discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Jim, and we really appreciate you uh, uh, participating from Canada, as you said, a very early start. Uh, Fran, uh, can we move to you, please, now? Hello, Chris and everybody. Uh, yes, my name is Francisco Kensky, Fran for everybody, and uh, I'm based in Buenos Aires, so it's early for me too. <laughs> and uh, I'm the founder of Cloud Gaia. Cloud Gaia is a boutique multi-cloud Salesforce um, platinum partner that started in Argentina. And thanks to the, the, the IT, 
successfully moved to, to the UK, from where we expanded to the uh, several countries of Europe and the, and the US. We uh, help big customers such as Coca-Cola, Euro-Pacific uh, partners, Diageo, Medlife, Shredders, and other big companies take out the most out of Salesforce. And uh, it has been a very uh, good journey uh, with the with the DIT uh, helping establish in the UK, having our holding company there, and and uh, we moved our our legal headquarter to 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 London, and uh, and we are uh, we're very happy with uh, with that strategic move. We grew a lot. Uh, we have uh, we are five years old, and uh, thanks to that, we grew very much. And uh, all that growth was organic, so we never received uh, uh, fund any funding. All our growth has been from uh, you know from 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 the business, and and so uh, I really like the invitation and giving back to the rest of the community uh, because we have received so much from from you guys. So thank you very much, and I'm open for, for helping others uh, take the same direction. Thanks, Fran. And again, we really appreciate you dialing in from, from Buenos Aires, because uh, as you say, it's uh, not in the same time zone. OK, so thanks very much uh, to the three of you for participating today. Um, and I think what I'd like to do is to start casting uh, the clock back a little bit and thinking, putting yourself in your mindset of where you were a few years ago before you'd even thought about the UK. And you were thinking, we need to internationalize, but where should we go? And given the fact that you're coming from India, Canada and Argentina, Europe is seems like quite a long way away, but of course the UK is not the only destination. So what was it that made you think about the UK first? So let's start with you, Akash. What 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 was your rationale for, for coming to the UK? Yes, uh, yeah, thanks, Chris. Uh, so uh, I mean, to start with, I am an uh, alumnus of the London School of Economics, uh, the LSE, and my brother's also who's the co-founder. He's also an alumnus of the LSE. So we had a broad understanding of uh, the UK market. Uh, maybe at a personal level, because we studied there, we, we, knew, we knew what living in UK means. Uh, but that was not uh, the key reason for us to move to the UK. It was more uh, strategic in nature uh, because um, yes, India also offers a very strong and promising tech ecosystem, uh, but it is, it is uh, primarily uh, concentrated for the domestic market. Uh, but we uh, having studied in the UK and having had a global perspective, we were very clear from the start that you know we wanted a global presence, uh, a global reach uh, for what we were doing, and uh, UK sort of became a very good uh, strategic decision for us uh, because uh, being viewed as a UK headquartered company uh, gives us uh, a great global visibility. Uh, we've been able to tap um, actually the smaller untapped markets, the the smaller countries, maybe in uh, East Asia, uh, countries like Philippines. Uh, uh, you know, Vietnam, Indonesia, such countries, you know, they recognize uh, UK brands, uh, uh, you know, very greatly, even in the, on the Western side, if you go to markets like Brazil uh, or the Latin America, or even we've been to places like Trinidad and Tobago, um, so on and so forth. So even these are like uh, untapped markets, but very, very good markets. Uh, being viewed as a UK headquartered company gives a great global visibility. In fact, uh, the way uh, we have been perceived um, as a startup uh, is is actually gone on, uh, you know, many levels up. So yeah, I I would say it's a, it's definitely been a great decision for us to uh, move and uh, operate out of the UK. Thanks, thanks, Akash. Um, Jim, how about you? I mean, again, there were other destinations I suppose you had on your shortlist, but but why why was it the UK that was the most important market for you ultimately? Uh, Canada, uh, Canada is, I would describe Canada as, as quite far behind the UK in, in terms of tech ecosystem outside of um, several, you know, Toronto, Waterloo, Montreal, uh, Vancouver, but we're a very, very large country spread out. And uh, um, we uh, came to the UK back in 2017 on another business matter and went to a conference and we were 
it was it was quite clear to us that the things that were happening in the UK uh, in, as an integrated network was a scale that certainly I hadn't I hadn't at all appreciated. Um, and I could say that the UK, uh, when I tell people that um, you know that that we're focusing our work in the UK here in Canada, we tend people aren't aren't really familiar with with uh, what's going on uh, in the UK. So we're absolutely delighted to be there. Uh, it was the right place for us. It continues to be, and, and we look forward to uh, scaling up. Thanks, Jim. Uh, and Fran, um, again, uh, UK is one of perhaps several locations, and you think of the traditional uh, linkage between Latin America and Spain. Um, or, uh, so what, what was the, the most important factor for you in, in choosing UK ultimately to, to uh, build your business? So, so uh, our short list was the US, uh, UK, and Spain. Uh, of course, Spain for the language, for the climate, for so... Uh, and the reason we were moving um, and expanding it was because our customers were asking uh, to be more uh, near shore. Uh, so uh, from Spain, uh, attending to Coca-Cola and Diageo at that time, that were the, the two customers that were asking was, uh, um, you know, the 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 the, the top uh, in in the in the in the short list. Uh, U.S. was. Uh, um, we, we took away U.S. as, as a holding uh, place because of tax reasons. Uh, the whole operations would be uh, taxated in, in the U.S. Um, and the U.K. and Spain had similar, similar uh, tax regimes where the, our foreign uh, uh, income will be uh, excluded. So, uh, and uh, Spain rejected our, our working uh, visas for our uh, employees. Uh, we need to move from Argentina to Europe, our top uh, technology leaders who will train local uh, employees. And, uh, and the UK, we, we applied at that time for 10 positions and they told us, why so few? Do, don't you want 20? Uh, so it was, uh, <laughs> so, so that was, uh, and, and of course, uh, again, in that, uh, the DIT make, you know, help us, you know, uh, introduce the right people so so it was everything very uh, easy and, and friendly uh, and and now uh, we are doing the way back we are from the UK we are starting the Latin American headquarter in Uruguay so so uh, it's uh, it's funny how how it goes uh, Uruguay has a very also a very friendly regime for for IT companies and it's like um, uh, and, very, and the right incentives, and so uh, helping from uh, Colonia del Sacramento set up like a, a sort of a, a Silicon Valley uh, from Latin America from there. So, so uh, it's uh, it's like a way around. And uh, our last uh, um, and our last uh, uh, investment was in in Poland. Uh, so now we have our UK, Spain, and Poland. Uh, uh, based uh, uh, operations, everything uh, held from from the UK. So, so we're yeah. That was the reason. Thanks, Fran. That's great to hear. Um, I understand that uh, our fourth panelist, uh, Adam, uh, has actually now been able to, to join us. I think there were some technical issues before. So, Adam uh, Jaffa from. Uh, uh, from Voy app, uh, could you just give us a quick uh, intro and uh, explain a little bit about uh, your company and uh, uh, why the UK and uh, your immediate plans? Absolutely, thank you for that. Um, so my name is Adam, I was born and raised in the UK from uh, Brighton and uh, moved to Sweden uh, a couple of years ago to study uh, at university. Uh, it was a short trip at university, dropped out and uh, founded a company with uh, three other guys, 2018. Uh, so we just hit our th three year anniversary, uh, went faster than we expected, um, went from four founders to 800 employees in the past three years, um, successfully launched our product in, in about 80 markets and raised over $300 million um, dollars to date. Um, so the company name is Voy, uh, largest uh, micro mobility e-scooter sharing uh, company in Europe. Um, started off in Sweden and then slowly made our way to other European uh, markets. 
Um, it's a it's a highly it's becoming a regu regulated space. Um, and UK was also always kind of uh, on our radar, um, but it wasn't actually uh, legal, um, neither private or, or rental uh, scooters uh, for a long time until until last year. Um, and that's when the ci various cities started handing out kind of operating uh, operating licenses. And our approach is very much, you know, ask for permission, not for forgiveness. Um, so we started applying for these licenses and tenders and uh, have been very successful to date. We've been operating in the UK for uh, one year now. Uh, we're live in 16 cities in the UK, uh, many of which are exclusive. Um, and already we see the data coming in from one year that that kind of modal shift uh, from cars to scooters uh, from our user base is a staggering 35%. Th thanks, Adam. That's a great story, and uh, I think everybody walking around uh, urban environments in the in in the UK has seen uh, the, your presence in terms of uh, changing the landscape of transportation. Okay, let's uh, move on and think about another another question. Um, so, as you've begun to build your businesses in the UK, um, there are clearly things that 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 do you expect, and there are things that surprise. So, Jim, can I come to you first and and just ask? Um, as you came to the UK, what was it that, that really surprised you? Was it, you know, the market, how that worked, all the customers or, or engagements? Uh, so things that you were not perhaps expecting. Um, because we're pre-release, I, I, I don't, I can't give much insight in, 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 in market reaction to what we have yet. Um, but I can say that the, the, uh, um, the surprise uh, for us really was the the reception that we had to be able to build contacts uh, in the UK. Um, uh, lots of talent, lots of willingness to help, uh, and it and it every time we uh, we we attended a meeting, uh, it, it 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 simply reinforced for us that we were in the right spot. That, that's great to, to know, Jim. And um, uh, Fran, you already said that there were a few things that surprised you in terms of the willingness to, hey, bring some more people. Let's let's help you further with visas. Um, was there anything else that that surprised you, perhaps particularly with your customers um, that you you found so far? Well, the, actually, it was so everything was so easy. No, it was so so friendly. Uh, that was uh, we. Uh, I come from a very bu bureaucratic and complicated country for doing business. Uh, not only with the with the government, with the customers as well. So uh, uh, I think that uh, what surprised me with the customers was that uh, a yes was a yes, a no was a no. Uh, uh, first of August was first of August. <laughs> it, it's like uh, you know, certainty, no? Uh, have uh, in the business. Um, what you need less is uncertainty. And when we moved to, to, to the UK, what uh, surprised me most was like uh, uh, the, 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 the power of, of, of your world, no? the, 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 the thing that uh, things were what they were supposed to be and, and, and not the other way around as, as we're used to. So uh, I think that that, uh, you know, crystal clear rules of engagement and uh, and messages uh, that was what uh, what surprised me the most uh, uh, and uh, luckily we didn't have bad surprises uh, so it was all good surprises that that's always good when that happens when you get things that are, are slightly better than you expected and it's it's clear that the UK is one of the easiest places to do business in worldwide and I, I think Amy had some of those statistics in her presentation but let's come uh, to Akash um, how, how is your experience I know we talked right in the beginning of you were just kind of beginning to navigate the UK and of course you were here before at LSE but you know coming afresh with a, with a new company how, how was that experience in terms of engaging with your customer base and the market in general? Yes, yes. Uh, thanks a lot, Chris. Actually, I would like to thank uh, uh, Lee and uh, you for uh, helping us initially, at least uh, trying to understand the landscape, what was out there, because when we entered the market, we just had a broad picture that we want to look at UK as a strategic uh, uh, location to expand to. But uh, entering the market, understanding who are the local players, what is the tech scene, uh, that is something that uh, you know takes a while. But uh, thanks to the kind of support that we've received from DIT, um, through all the various specialists, uh, we've been able to try and uh, get capture, I mean, understand the players uh, much more quicker. Uh, but what really surprised us is the kind of worldview that we got 
uh, being located in the UK. Uh, uh, you know, had I been perhaps uh, in another country, I would have my view would have uh, perhaps been restricted uh, to that particular country. But DIT uh, offers offered such an excellent ecosystem globally because it has offices across almost in each and every country across the world, and there are like so many events uh, and workshops happening. Uh, so that we try and understand the market before uh, beforehand, uh, and that that kind of gave us um, a fantastic worldview, and it accelerated our uh, learning curve much faster. Uh, when I say uh, what we would have taken a lot more time to experiment and figure out and learn, uh, that that learning curve got reduced uh, quite drastically. We were able to sharpen our propositions. Uh, to a large extent, uh, I'm sure there were a lot of uh, developments that we made since our uh, since the last time we spoke. And uh, uh, so, yeah, I think that uh, kind of uh, worldview and uh, uh, sharpening of our business model that really happened in the UK. Uh, a general sort of surprise which we were not uh, prepared for, but was a learning for us was uh, we tend to take things um, for granted. We we don't really. Uh, we tend to underestimate what ex uh, exists uh, out there already. Uh, but when we went to the uh, UK, we got a very uh, realistic perspective. So we had to kind of take our offerings one notch up and that actually helped us uh, while uh, while we were going global. Uh, so in that sense, I would say uh, it was a great learning and a great uh, uh, experience for us in terms of getting market access, market research and uh, an overall global perspective as an entrepreneur. I think that we lost Greece. Okay, sorry. I my microphone was No, I'm I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, now we can. No, we don't. Can you hear me okay? Uh, yes. Okay. Um so Adam, I, I just want to ask uh, the same question in terms of um, uh, understanding what was the surprise to you? You're in a particularly interesting situation because you grew up in the UK, but then moved to Sweden and then come back in terms of, um, of engagement with the market. What was the surprise for you from that? Yeah, really good question. I think we were also, um, uh, for, for, fortunately, no negative surprises, but mostly uh, positively surprised, um, I think, uh, by the demand, actually. Um, so uh, obviously, we launched in many markets before before the UK as well, but we really did see uh, uh, quite the uptick in the UK as we as we were deploying our scooters um, uh, throughout various cities where, you know, we just get the confirmation again that people people love scooters. Um, and you might not think that if you only read uh, only read the headlines uh, where people have various opinions about them. But I think in general, looking at the, the, the consumer and the, and the user base, uh, people generally appreciate the fun and personal freedom that they get um, I, riding, riding these vehicles. Um, I think I'm more not... importantly, the, uh, the convenience as well. Um, and we also see in comparison to e-bikes, for example, or bikes, that people are much more inclined the other... to try a scooter than um, than our e-bikes. Uh, so we reach kind of a million rides way faster with e-scooters than we do with e-bikes. Um, and to add to that as well, I think also positively surprised by kind of the appetite uh, from uh, authorities and government and, 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 and council um, to, you know, happily be part of the discussion and support kind of innovative, uh, innovative tech that, that actually solves problems. Um, and I think e-scooters uh, are just that, uh, but that's not something we should take for granted. Um, and if we are to continue uh, succeeding, then we really need to, to, to keep innovating. I'm just gonna come on because it sounds- Sorry, like let, let me try that question again. Um, Uh, uh, so the, the question was for Akash and uh, was around uh, what is the um, your, your perception of the tech environment in the UK in terms of startup companies and uh, the uh, the tech environment. What do you think we're going to be seeing as key themes go forward over the next 
couple of years. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, thanks a lot, Chris. Uh, so uh, I've been following the UK tech ecosystem uh, for a while now. I, I, I have been a startup ecosystem enabler in India. I, I ran and managed uh, one of India's largest uh, incubator, startup incubator, also worked with Facebook, managed the startup programs. So, uh, I, uh, I mean, I did develop a broad understanding of how the ecosystem works, but when it came to the UK, uh, it was quite a thriving uh, tech ecosystem, mainly uh, because, uh, you know, fintech, uh, and especially out of London uh, and uh, other places. I think I may be having some communication issues, so I'm going to switch off for a minute. Yeah. So uh, the fintech ecosystem has been really, really strong uh, because uh, uh, you know the kind of fundraise that has happened uh, with regards to fintech startups in the Akash, UK. Akash, did you been... did you hear my question? Yes, yes, yes. Did. Um, I yeah. Are, are you able to hear me, Chris? Um, Uh, so I, I'll just continue uh, the, the, then. Uh, so yeah, I, I think uh, the, the fintech space has been uh, quite interesting. Uh, we've seen a lot of the UK-based startups expand globally. Uh, then uh, I think Tech for Good has been a great theme that we've explored uh, while in the UK because it's it's kind of picking up uh, quite quite a big deal. Uh, even mental health startups uh, is a space that I've seen growing uh, rapidly. And tech has been doing well. Mobility. Uh, electric vehicles, uh, especially, have, have kind of scaled up uh, drastically over the recent times. Uh, so, yeah, I would say all in all, it's a great place uh, for some, for any tech venture uh, to think of uh, growing and expanding their business. Even for startup nerd, we are a digital first company where uh, we help entrepreneurs uh, build and launch their uh, ventures digitally. When I say this, like right from training uh, the entrepreneurs digitally to offering digital talent and even uh, offering the right kind of tech uh, to build their POC or MVP and launch it in the market, we kind of uh, tend to support them. So I would say uh, for a company like ours, uh, UK becomes a, a great uh, tech ecosystem, uh, and I'm sure uh, for, for the other startups as well. Thanks very much. Um, this is Joanna. I'm just going to um, pose the next question whilst we see if we can get Chris back in. Um, and this is really to um, to all of you. So I'll, I'll go around. What was the best piece of advice um, you received from someone in the UK? Um, and similarly, what advice would you give? Would you pass over to a, a tech company, another tech company looking at the UK? If you could stick to one on the way in and one on the way out, if, if that makes sense. So, um, Jim, maybe if I start with you. Yeah, thanks, Joanna. I'd say uh, the best advice we received was to dive in, um, uh, go to events, shake hands. Uh, where You never know who you'll meet uh, and how they'll help. And uh, I, the, the pay it forward uh, attitude is, is really is everywhere in, uh, in, from what we've seen in the, in the tech ecosystem there. And uh, I'm not sure I've, I've seen it elsewhere. I, I certainly have seen it in the UK. Uh, your, the second part of your question, Joanna. What 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 advice would you pass on to another tech company? So oh, method. okay, sure, sure. Um, uh, boy, uh, what would I what would I, what would my advice be? Well, my advice would be that um, um, I have uh, we've been working with uh, with Joanna's group for three years now, actually, and um, and uh, having having a having a rep. Um, uh, on the ground in London uh, to be able to open doors, especially if you're from out of the country and you're coming into London, coming into the UK to try and check out what the scene is and whether you really want to want to be there, you really need somebody who can can get doors open for you quickly. And uh, and uh, uh, Joanna's group did that in spades for us. So I'd rec I highly recommend uh, some advanced planning and and uh, as some of the other panelists have mentioned, uh, get 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 uh, get in in advance and. And, and, and get a handle on what's going on and then you can, you can really uh, adjust your plans accordingly when you've done that. Um, thanks, Jim. As you know, that wasn't rehearsed everyone, because, but thank you very much for that uh, comment on us. Um, Chris, just for your information, that was just the question on uh, best advice in and best advice to pass on. And I'd only just got to Jim first, so I'll hand back to you. 
Okay, uh, so you, you just just Jim has answered that question. So shall we pass on to Fran then to comment? And apologies for dropping out there. I think uh, uh, there was a connection issue at my end. Sorry. So Fran. Yes, well, uh, I will. Yeah, I, I I will agree with Jim uh, on uh, on the uh, advice uh, given to everybody that uh, you know get in touch with the DIT, their awesome team. I remember that you, Chris move from one side of the city to the other to meet my business partner, Nicolas. Uh, uh, and uh, here in Argentina, Carolina has been really, really helpful. Uh, uh, Jorge also. So, you know, you have a, a great team and uh, it's available for everybody to, to you know, to, to, to get in touch with you and, and you will receive a lot of help. So I will agree with, with Jim on that. And the best uh, advice I received from you guys was, uh, to set up in in I think it was level thirty nine in Canary Wharf, the 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 co working place. So that was great. We met great people there. It was very you know a great community and uh, everybody sharing. So it was uh it that was that helped us a lot. Uh, so uh, you know locations is is very important in tech. We have this uh, open mind and and you know. Of, of collaborating with other companies. Uh, so being in a co-working uh, space is, uh, I think it's a, it's a very good idea. So thank you for that as well. Thanks, Fran. Um, Adam, can we go, go, sorry, Jim, did you wanna come back and uh, um, say something there? Yeah, just quickly, uh, uh, the DIT uh, has been uh, fantastic for us and uh, we are now uh, part of the Eagle Labs um, Legal Tech uh, Incubator Accelerator, and it's it's just been it's been fantastic. I just wanted to add that to, to my to my earlier answer. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Um, so, Akash, uh, how about from your perspective uh, in terms of uh, those er early helpful things, not just from DIT and, and the participants here, but maybe from the broader community as well? Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah, thanks, Chris. Uh, I, I was going to thank you, first of all, because uh, uh, one of the early advice that you had given us, you had pointed us to a, a, a list of resources of potential, uh, uh, you know, organizations that we could work with. And NACU, uh, which is the largest uh, uh, student enterprise uh, uh, body uh, in the UK, uh, was actually pointed out to us. So we ended up doing a pilot with them, which proved to be very helpful. Uh, for us uh, in terms of a UK market entry. Uh, but beyond that, from the from a broader community perspective, we've been mentored by uh, Nick Newman, uh, who's, uh, who's a partner VC at uh, Emerge Education, a leading at VC. So we were actually introduced to him uh, as part of the London and Partners program, uh, through which uh, we got very, very strong, very, very sharp mentoring. We've had like multiple mentoring sessions on uh, sharpening our route to market, uh, we've already been told what exactly what is already being tried out in the market. So that actually saved us a, a few years of experiments that we would have done otherwise. Uh, and that that kind of gave us a lot of value add and helped us uh, uh, approach our problem in the right direction. So uh, I would say, uh, you know, big thanks to DIT. I'm not saying because everyone is saying is because we really uh, mean it and we've received the kind of support and um, you know, constantly from the time we landed in the UK. So uh, Lee, Lee Worthing has been uh, supportive. And of course, we got a great uh, uh, worldview from the uh, broader tech ecosystem as well. Thank you. Thanks, Akash. Um, and Adam, from, from your perspective, uh, how what kind of advice have you received that's been really useful and, and kind of guidance and introductions? Yeah, I think this one was mentioned already, but I think it's really important to have people uh, on the ground in the UK when you're entering um, that just know the uh, know the market, know the culture, um, know the way around. Um, other than that, I think uh, we also learned that, you know, there's no there's no blueprint for success either. Um, so it really comes down to your ability to uh, kind of adapt and navigate in, in a new territory. Um, and, you know, you won't have all the answers. Um, and I think the best advice I've been given is to kind of uh, be extremely confident in our ability to execute uh, and get the job done, but constantly question our methodology uh, and iterate on that until we get it right. 
Okay, that's that's good. Thank, thanks, Adam. Um, I wanted to move on and, and just uh, think about some of the things that have been a bit more difficult because we recognize that when you're building a business and particularly building a business internationally, not everything goes in a straight line. So I guess there have been some difficult things for you to deal with uh, in the UK. And I'd be interested in what an example of one of those and perhaps how you've, you've responded, how you've got around it or how you've dealt with it. So Fran, can we come to you, you first? Well, uh, I think that yeah, maybe it's a, it's a very common, but opening the bank account was was really difficult, and we had the Santander, the same bank in Argentina, uh, that was working with us uh, and in, in the UK, and it was like eight months of a night nightmare. Uh, uh, so uh, have that well from scratch uh, and. Uh, yeah, um, and, and we finally solved it because uh, uh, we 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 change of a brand and you use a brand that was um, that was uh, in connection with the uh, IT. So 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 uh, again, thank you for for untying that. Uh, so that was uh, that that was the the thing uh, that was more more difficult for us, uh, and it shouldn't have uh, because you know we were the same customers in one place than the, than the other. Uh, but anyway. Um, from uh, from 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 Claudia, that was. That that's interesting to hear, Fran. And I think lots of companies do struggle with with bank accounts, and that's where DIT and our professional uh, service part partners can help with that. And we we mm -hmm. have been down that track to support companies companies many times. So, but it's good, I think, for this audience to recognise that opening a bank bank account. We lost your audio. It's not necessarily straightforward, but there is help out there. Jim, can we come to you? To, uh, come, hello? Jim, can we come to you uh, and ask the, the same question? What has been difficult for, for you to, and how did you overcome it? In a, in a yeah, sure. Uh, a couple of things come to mind uh, in an earlier iteration of our platform, which we we launched in uh, uh, Tech London Tech Week in 2019. Uh, we were scrambling to get our MVP ready. And meanwhile, I was scrambling to get my mind around the GDPR. So we had some, uh, we had some frantic moments to really understand what it is we needed to do and comply before we actually hit go on the, on the platform. Um, and you know, we, we we found some great help to to sort of get us through that thicket. Um, and the other, it really is, uh, as Alex mentioned earlier, um, we've had, uh, you know, we've been caught by a few last minute deadlines uh, with things at companies house. And um, um, we could probably have done that a little bit better. So uh, uh, boots on the ground, always a good idea. <laughs> So, so uh, again, I think what this illustrates is starting these conversations with people like Alex and Joanna and, and James and other other uh, advisors that can help you to get started and to, to put all of those things in place early. Um, Adam, could we go to you and um, ask the same sort of question in terms of uh, what what was difficult? I mean, you knew the UK quite well because you, you, you used to be here, but I guess going to Sweden and coming back, that, that pr presumably presented some challenges. Yeah, exactly. And I think uh, an interesting challenge with uh, kind of consumer products is always kind of the potential psychological barriers that you may meet as well, right? So this reminds me of kind of, you know, when Uber launched and the psychological barrier is, you know, you're really going to get into a car with a stranger or Airbnb, are you really going to live in a stranger's house? But eventually those become uh, completely normal behaviors. And I think it's something that we kind of saw as well with, uh, you know, suddenly there are scooters all over the place. So kind of uh, on a psychological level, how do consumers and people uh, react to that? So I think an interesting challenge is kind of perception of the product uh, as well. And then also the media has their own opinions on things and then headlines, one day they love you, one day they hate you um, kind of thing. Uh, so kind of dealing with, uh, uh, I think dealing with the perception um, of uh, the product has been an interesting, uh, interesting challenge. Uh, another one has been kind of around uh, and they're tightly connected, I would say, around kind of accessibility and, and, and you know, looking at uh, dealing with vulnerable groups, for example. Um, but that's something that we've learned to kind of involve them more and more, um, whether it's, you know, various partners that are working with supporting vulnerable groups to involve them more and more in the discussion, uh, for example, that feeds into our product development and how we can uh, make our product kind of more, you know, you know, void for all and think about accessibility uh, as a part of the product design as well. 
Okay, great. And finally, Akash, um, in terms of you, in terms of uh, unexpected challenges and how you dealt with them. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I think there were a, there were a few challenges. I must say, one is uh, purely from our venture perspective. Uh, we were uh, so I think the market size that we were trying to address uh, was was uh, slightly smaller uh, uh, when when we kind of entered the UK market, uh, but that kind of uh, uh, got corrected and we were able to evolve uh, to to an offering which which had a greater market size uh, and uh, that's something hap that that happened because of the learnings that we got from the UK market when we hit the ground uh, we kind of uh, you know got learnings of what works and what doesn't and uh, that that kind of helped us uh, uh, sharpen our uh, proposition uh, and the other learning has just generally been around. Uh, uh, you know the the time it takes uh, uh, to kind of gain certain foothold in the market. Like uh, it does happen, it it happens slowly but surely. Maybe maybe it could have been because of the sector that we've been uh, in. Uh, but yeah, you need to give it that time uh, and invest and do your research and build relationships, and slowly things will start to happen. So we've just been it's it's just been under a year uh, since we moved to the UK. Uh, so we moved uh, end of last year. So. Uh, we are gaining a foothold, but we've definitely seen that uh, growth happen uh, over some time. So, yeah, that, that's been the best. Thank you. And uh, as we're coming up to the end of this particular panel, I just wanted to say thank you to, to all four participants. And I think the take home messages here are, are quite clear. Um, thinking about your, your plan. Uh, for the UK for your internationalization journey, uh, planning uh, to start early, so engaging with all of those professional advisors uh, before you perhaps think you might need them, and not making too many assumptions about UK customers, but but listening and getting the the experience of others who've already been there before. But once again, Fran, Akash, Jim, and Adam, thanks very much. And I'm now going to pass back to Justin for the um, uh, VC panel. Thank you very much. Yeah. Hello, and thank you, Chris. Um, moving on to the VC panel, which uh, I'm very excited to introduce some of our uh, panelists. Um, I wonder if we have them here. Um, we're looking for John from Smegvik Capital, Lucas from FirmCap, and Seb from Boulderton. Um, we have John. Thank yeah. you very much. Um, perhaps, John, if I could just ask everyone, around about three minutes, a quick introduction of, from yourself and your firm, that would be wonderful. John, if you'd like to start. Thank you. Yeah, please do. Um, thank you for having me. Uh, John Lerner, I'm a Managing Director at Smebig Capital. Um, we're a London-based fund doing Series A and Series B investments uh, across the UK and the Nordics. Uh, we've been doing it uh, just over 25 years now. That's obviously changed a lot over that time. Uh, but in general, we're still doing the same thing, which is try and find young, fast growing companies that we can both give them financial capital, but also help them along their journey with any support that we can give from our organization. Uh, by background, I'm an ex-consultant, so I did electrical electronic engineering at university uh, and then was at Bain & Company doing consulting on global corporates for uh, quite a long period. And our whole team has the same background, so very much deploying um, that consulting skill set to small, fast-growing companies. Thank you. Um, much appreciate, John. Perhaps, Lucas, you could step in. Yeah, perfect. Hi, everyone. My name is Lucas Stoops. And I work at uh, Fordham Mass Capital. We are an early stage VC fund and we invest across the UK and, uh, and the rest of, of Europe. Uh, but I would say mostly in the UK. I think 70% of the business we do is in the UK. Um, and we invest in what I call C plus Series A and Series B companies. We typically tend to focus on the B2B space, um, B2B or B2B2C. Uh, we, we can also do consumer, but we do it less, in all honesty. Um, in terms of sector, um, we're quite broad, you know, we're quite heavy in fintech, 40% of our fund in fintech, but we can also do, you know, the classical sales uh, companies to gaming, and uh, you name it, we have quite a broad range of topics we like to invest, invest in. If you were to think about us as a company, so we have a, a small seed fund, which we do very small tickets, 50 to 100K, but we also have a growth fund, and that's the main fund. Uh, that's a 100 million fund where we invest tickets of, let's say, 1 to 2 million uh, to, be, to begin with, but we can go up all the way to 5 to 10 million 
across the life cycle um, of a fund, uh, of a, sorry, of a fundraiser to companies. So again, early stage, UK, Europe, uh, ideally B2B and let's say one to two million uh, to start as an investment. Thank you, Lucas. Um, perhaps Seb, you could uh, finish for us. Um, great to meet you, everyone. I'm Sebastian. I'm uh, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, I'm an investor at Boulders and Capital in London. Uh, we are a venture fund that's been around for about two decades, uh, based out of London. Uh, initially, we're a benchmarks team in Europe and then transitioned into our own fund. Um, invest out of two funds right now. Um, one which is an early stage fund that's sort of one to about $20 million tickets um, in seed Series A companies. I think the majority is sort of Series A or thereabouts. Um, in an eight to $10 million range. And then as of last year, we also invest uh, beyond that from a new fund that's $680 million and that does uh, growth tickets. So that's uh, Series B, Series C and beyond. Um, as a fund, I think we've been around um, quite a long time in London. We've seen the ecosystem in the UK and Europe change quite a bit in that time period. Um, but I've always kind of invested with the same thesis, which is that Europe's a great place to build category defining companies, uh, companies that can either go and build out a, a large new category or become winners in it. Um, and we've consistently tried to find those teams across Europe uh, and back them. Um, one of the other things we do and which we found very valuable, and which we've invested in a lot over the years is to build out a platform, um, which essentially means we have a team uh, of about 15 people or so who work on supporting portfolio companies on anything from marketing and PR to legal, to finance, to uh, talent and so on and so forth. And then personally, uh, I started life as a consultant, um, then joined an e-scooter company um, that was a competitor of voice called Cirque, um, kind of built out that business from 10 to 1,000 employees and then back to uh, less than 600. Um, and joined Boulderson about a year and a half ago. And I primarily invest in consumer and in B2B SaaS for small businesses. So anything that kind of gives a rapidly growing business or a small business, um, what I like to call superpowers, whether that's internal processes, productivity, um, anything like that. Okay. Thank you, Sebastian. Um, let's keep the order um, guys going through. I'm gonna to go to the, the first question now. Um, and if John, you want to start, please. I think probably it's gonna be the most important question, which is how do applicants get in touch with you? <laughs> how do they apply? to your fund for investment? So we're super open. Um, we've got a well-published email address on our website uh, and a type form form where people can just uh, put, put in their application. Uh, most of our email addresses are public. People get in contact on LinkedIn. So lots of different ways. We look at every, we're trying to look at everything that comes in and genuinely do. Um, as you go through the type form experience, it very much takes you through a journey of making sure that you are a fit. Uh, and by doing that, we, we sort of reduce the, the number of inbounds that we're just going to have to say no straight away to. Uh, so just checking really basic things like, are you in a geography we invest in? Is it check size in a series uh, maturity of company that we invest in? But other than that, we're, we're very, very open. Thank you, John. Uh, Lucas? That's the same for us. We, we, we have a lot of LinkedIn inbound. We also use an email address called pitch at fomcap.com, so P-I-T-C-H quite easy. Ideally, a warm introduction always is still a bit the best, I would say. Uh, but again, like, uh, like John as well, we, we look at anything that, uh, that crosses our board. So, uh, okay, thank you, Lucas. Sebastian. Yeah, similarly, um, a lot of inbound ability to contact us kind of um, with a cold introduction. We also try to speak a lot with different angels uh, and earlier stage funds understand their portfolio. So, um, if, for example, Lucas invested in you in all likelihood, uh, he will hopefully put you in touch. Um, and, uh, and one other thing we do, and I think a lot of other funds do as well, is we've started doing a lot of proactive research. Uh, so we, we dedicate significant resource to understanding up and coming sectors and technologies um, and find people within them who are building interesting things, whether that's through GitHub, LinkedIn, um, conferences that are coming back, things like that. Um, and I guess the only other thing that we do that's very helpful is we do a lot of kind of open office hours um, or pitch events, things like that, um, which are always extremely helpful. Um, and we hope that we can do more and more of those in person because there's nothing better than to talk about your business and then grab a coffee and get to know you as a person as well. Thank you. 
Um, on to the next question, um, John, as an investor, what really stands out for you in an applicant's pitch? Yeah, I think that's that's difficult. I think we've heard everyone on this panel talk about uh, investing across different stages. And as you invest across different stages, there's very much different things that you're looking for. Um, so we don't do so much seed. So I'll let Lucas and maybe Seb talk a little bit about what stands out there. If I focus on Series A, um, it's really about having proper product market fit and a real vision. Um, and if you can get those two things over, so you have the vision, the passion, and you can prove that what you've got already is really working and you really understand who your customer is and why they're buying you, that's what really cuts through everything else. Because ultimately that's what will get you from series A and beyond. Um, and I think that wraps up all the other great things we look for, like culture and quality of founders that can all come across in, in that vision, passion, product market fit. Okay. Thanks, Joe. I mean, a lot of our guys and girls here today are seed and round eight. So that's really helpful. Um, I think, Lucas, if I could ask you, what are the common mistakes that you might have seen or your team? Um... But there are a couple of things that come back. Um, I think but maybe the first one, uh, which is most relevant, I think the capital ask needs to be a bit in line with where the business is. Yeah? Sure, we are in a bull market uh, everywhere. Everything is bull market, but you know, not every crazy thing uh, gets through. So please make sure that whenever you raise capital, you've thought it through. You also think about how much money you need for, for to get to the next uh, milestone. And I think one thing I would like to add is where we sometimes see quite the you know frustration on our end is but we see a massive correlation between how founders and management interact with us you know the quality of the of the materials the way they communicate and the performance after we invest and so we always ask ourselves the way you behave with us you know hopefully we presume you will do the same to your clients and if you are not behaving well to us and not, not, about, not about behaving but not communicating clear or, or whatever then we have a good indication, okay, if that's how you communicate to clients, that might not be the best way to do it. So I think be very open and clear to, to VCs. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. It comes from two ends. It's not always the VC who says no. Sometimes the company says no. Uh, but please, when you interact, just be very open, very direct. Um, don't take two weeks to send over a financial model um, because for us, it's one of the key performance indicators of you know post-investment performance as well. So I would say those two things that are and I'm coming to mind for myself. That is um, great advice. And, and just in case you're wondering what was said then, to be clear, um, a lot of our applicants are from outside the UK. Um, so it's your valuations, right? What you're asking for, for investment and, uh, and, and performing well to your investor. So that's a really insightful. Thank you. Um, Seb, would you mind to um, expand on that? Yeah, I think it, the, the two things I'd sort of add in there probably quite tactical about how you pitch the business but i think what we're looking for is an ambitious vision and a drive and i guess a spark and a creativity and a vision um but a lot of realism and openness um and a degree of trust in where you're at at that journey um and so one of the things for me it's a really big mistake is when we're talking to a business and it turns out that um numbers are very selectively presented um <laughs> Things like, you know, contracts that are not closed, that are booked as revenue or are shown as revenue, um, calculations of things like uh, acquisition costs for customers that exclude a huge amount of, of cost that is involved in, in running a customer, um, or just any kind of creative manipulation of numbers, really. I think that just immediately breaches a lot of trust um, throughout the process. Inevitably, we kind of get there, whether that's in a first pitch, uh, and then we start doing DD and then we find out that sort of what you said isn't quite true. Um, so that's kind of where I would really caution is I think as a founder, when you're going out and you're pitching your business, I think it's right to be extremely ambitious about what you want to achieve and, and to really have a lot of imagination about where that might go and how you might grow that in the product and where you want to take the business. But a lot of honesty and integrity about where the business is at today. Um, in the end of the day, we see hundreds of businesses a year. Uh, we invest in, you know, dozens, 
over the course of a fund. Um, and so we know that the journey isn't kind of a very straightforward one, um, but we want to have the faith and the confidence that we can work together with you uh, on that journey. So that would, I guess, be my biggest caution. Um, I'd like to ask you, John, um, what do you look for in a founder or a founded team? Maybe two qualities. Yeah, I think we, we, we touched on this a little bit and uh, founder and founder team is, is maybe slightly different ones. It, it's, um, I think it was Seb used the word spark. I think that's a really, really good one. There's definitely a spark. There's, it is an incredibly tough journey being an entrepreneur. So if I had two qualities for a founder, it would be work ethic and spark. If you can get those two together, that's a, a really um, fantastic combo. When you talk about founding teams, I, we then start to look about uh, complementarity would be the, the word that I think is really important. Making sure that each of the founders has a distinct role um, that they are growing into. So maybe it's one's a tech type person, one's a sales type person, uh, and that's how they're going to grow out. Thank you. Uh, Lucas. Lucas, we can to that. Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, obviously you have all the, all the more typical things like product focus and all that stuff, but I think two things we always like to look at as well, which might be interesting is uh, yeah, the way you've used capital before, how efficient are you with using your capital? That for us is also quite important because you know, you have this funny reasoning in venture capital that people tend to give 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 twenty percent of the shares away, and if they need one million, their business is worth five million. If they need two million, suddenly the business is worth ten million. How <laughs> the cost base just increased? So, trying to really understand what is the efficiency of capital, and what we also find very important, what we call access in your go-to market and sales. Meaning, I give a very simple example: a twenty-two-year-old, if he creates a financial product, it's relatively unlikely he will be very successful at the big banks from the start. It's different if people have 20 years of experience in that sector and know everyone within this sector. So what we call access in your go-to market, we think that's quite important as well because the product obviously is super important, but at some point execution, having access, doing the sales uh, can really make, a, make or break a company. So we always look at that as well. Can they sell it? Do they have the, you know, do they have the access? The exit strategy, that's good to know. Um, Sebastian? Yeah, I guess the only thing we doubt from our end is we like to see a sense of insurgency. Um, and that probably fits a little bit with how we think about kind of building or capturing categories. But great founders at Seed, at Series A, tend to have um, a really pronounced vision of why their industry is broken or why customers aren't served well or underserved. Um, and have that as a very strong drive to go out every day and crack products, crack sales, uh, hire people and bring them on board. And so I think that's probably one thing I'd add on our end is we really love a healthy sense of insurgency around the industry people are trying to change. Um, and it's fine for that to be opinionated. It's fine for that to be a little bit uh, off the charts, um, but we'd love to see that in founders. Thank you. Uh, and for all those of you who are listening, um, as a VC ourselves, these are fantastic tips. So I hope you're making lots of notes. Um, John, let's get to the actual crux of why we're all here. What type of returns are you looking for as a VC? Hmm. I think that's a, that's a really good one. Again, I think this has to be caveated with what stage you're investing at. We certainly look at different returns models for things that we're investing at uh, A than at B. Um, broadly, the way we look at it is at series A stage, you're looking at at least a five times return in, in your base case modeling. Um, and at series B, you're looking at at least a three times return in your base case modeling. Um, and in reality, there needs to be the runway for it to be much greater than that. So we would say with series A, there has to be a credible path to at least 10x. And you probably, to be honest, you probably want a uh, a plausible path to 10x with your Series B as well. And the reason, you know, people might sit there and think, well, hang on, why do you need such a big return? That's a bit greedy, isn't it? The reality is the fail rates are high because we're backing early stage businesses. And therefore, in order to get a good return for all our investors, we have to get a great return on the ones that win. Thank you, John. Lucas? 
Yeah, I mean, on our end, three things. So if we make an investment, we're aiming for a 10x as well. And we need to see the path. That's one thing. On our own fund, what we target for our investors is a 3x. So there is indeed a fail rate, but we aim for a 3x. And the last thing I would like to add is for us as a fund, when we talk to RLPs, cash on cash returns are more important than an optimized IRR. So we try to really invest for the long term uh, and prefer to have a 10x in 10 years than a 2x in one year. And I know the math is not, not the same, but, <laughs> but to give you an idea, we, we, do, we like cash on cash uh, much more. So long term, big opportunity, that's where we would like to be. Okay, thank you, Sebastian. I think all has been said really. Um, the idea as earlier, the earlier you do invest, the more, the larger the outcome ideally needs to be. And I think Lucas makes a fair point as well. It's, uh, it needs to be a credible path to an exit at some point in time that will return cash. Um, so yeah, that, because there, there is maybe to just make a small side note on that. If you're in a bull market, like you are right now, there is an, it's easy for, or easy. It's, uh, there's enough capital chasing companies to see markups between rounds and to have uh, kind of paper returns that seem to make sense. But at the end of the day, we have a responsibility towards our investors to return their capital and more. And so we want to invest in businesses that eventually one day can be standalone businesses that go public or are a valuable asset to be acquired, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, noted, thank you. Um, let's move on to demographics. Can I just ask last year, two years, um, what do you see in terms of um, gender and ethnicity in terms of your investments for founders, please? John. Uh, yeah, good question. Um, I think our awareness has materially changed over the last two years, but I don't think um, I don't think the spread of what we have been seeing inbound in the pipeline has particularly changed in the last 24 months in terms of ratio of female founders to male founders. Um, and uh, therefore, I don't think our ratio of investing has materially, I, I know our ratio of investing hasn't materially changed. So we, we, we're we much more conscious of it. I'd say, actually, it's the it's what we see within the companies that has changed a lot more. So every single one of our portfolio companies is far more... Um, far more active in diversity and therefore our senior management teams are becoming more diverse and our boards are becoming more diverse. That's changing at a greater pace in my view than, than whether we back male or female founders. Thank you. Yeah, I totally agree. I was going to add, say exactly the same. You know, we see, you know, diversity comes in many ways and we see it mostly within the teams now. Eh? I think five years ago, you would have more easily seen, you know, three ex-investment bankers, you know, white male raising capital. And I think uh, that it's, you know, sometimes it still happens, but it's much more diverse now. Now you see people coming from all over the place. And that also, I think, is well, not only is the market changing a bit, but what you also see is, I think, because many companies have been successful and you see basically exited founders or exited senior management uh, setting up new companies. Uh, and that also, by definition, creates more a diverse set of people uh, entering the, the new market, if I may call it like that. So, yeah, totally agree with John. Okay, thank you, Lucas. Um, Sebastian, please. Yeah, I think I guess what I add to the point John made is that we're all trying to be significantly more conscious about it. Um, for one, I, as a fund, I think we've defined uh our sustainable future goals which explicitly include a lot around diversity in pipeline and talent and hiring and how we support portfolio companies on that um that change is taking a while because i think two factors one is access and i think that's something we're all pushing on very much in trying to have more dedicated events that are for example uh female founder office hours or in any case kind of getting to see candidates that we normally might not get through warm referrals quite as much um, but the other part is the venture ecosystem tends to be a reflection of the talent that comes up through tech companies. Um, and unfortunately, I think it's changing year over year, but it's still a slow change in terms of people that are exiting companies or that have been early employees at companies or that have uh, set up leadership functions at companies that then start companies themselves. And so that is still taking time and we're seeing that improve over time, but it's we're not quite there yet. I think that we have uh, a venture ecosystem and a tech ecosystem that's a, a, an accurate reflection of society at, at large. Um, the bigger question, I think, is what we can do more about that. 
Uh, and to some degrees, that's about what we try to look for as funds. Uh, I think to other degrees, it's also a reflection of who are the investors. Um, in the end of the day, there's kind of a, a tendency to invest in people and models and markets that you understand. Um, and realistically, I'm quite clueless on Femtech, for example, because a lot of the problems I don't personally experience. Um, and so it's helpful to see there that a lot of funds are getting more diverse uh, investor teams, uh, more diverse GPs, more diverse LPs as well, so investors within the funds, because all that pushes us to see the opportunity of tech and uh, kind of talented founders in a much broader pool than we have so far. Okay, thank you. Um, what I'd like to do now, um, guys, is to ask you to give a personal bit of advice to all those prospective founders out there and applicants um, for their journey, if you don't mind starting that, John. Hmm. Um, this is a difficult one because you could give so many. Um, I think the best bit of advice I could give would be um, don't buy into the what I call the cult of the entrepreneur too much um, or, or the, the cult of the VC entrepreneur. There's It's sort of become folklore that... Uh, to be successful, you have to raise big round after big round after big round. And that those uh, who have been successful, and you see in the headlines, have had a linear path to success. And, and my experience, and I'd love to hear what Lucas has said, things, it's just none of that is true. I've seen some incredibly successful entrepreneurs who've never taken VC funding, who actually end up more wealthy than some of the ones you know better, if that's your goal in life, is, is all about monetary gain. Some businesses are perfectly poised for VC backing and they should go and get them and they should go and change the world. Some aren't. Um, and none of even the very successful stories that I've had the pleasure to be a part of have been linear. And therefore you need to prepare yourself for the ups and the downs of that journey. Thank you, John. Lucas. Yeah, I think uh, I, I, you know, of course I agree with that. I think, you know, focus on, on the business and on, 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 you know, having a product that customers want and the rest will follow from that. Huh? I think that's important. Um, I think also something I would like to add is try and be as efficient with your time as possible. Huh? Uh, time and capital are in shortage. And so be mindful, you know, try and surround yourself with good people uh, people who have done it before because you will learn so much from them. I see so many people losing time like doing one year market study or one year this, one year that. I stop and just start building the product and 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 and, and get going. You know, it's it's unbelievable. I think the media does not always portray a very good uh, image of, of how it really works. It's but a a lot tougher uh, than people think. Uh, and B valuation uh, and valuation and raise is typically an output. Uh, it's not an input. And I think that's where some people really um, you know don't don't see that yet. Um, yeah, I think that's what I would say. You know, and just you know you have to be passionate about it. And it's it's going to be painful. And you know I'm sure at some point if all goes well, every good business good business uh, has been funded in my view. I mean most of them. 99%. Sometimes something can go off, you know, COVID hits or whatever, and you, you're in March 2020 uh, raising. But uh, if your business is good and people trust you as a person and like what you're doing, it will always work out. Thank you, Lucas. Um, Sebastian? So I've got sort of two that, that probably are also a reflection of, of what we experienced uh, when building Cirque. I think one is actually quite specific to, to fundraising. Um, in the end of the day, when you take money from someone, you partner with them in the long run. And as time goes by and as your company becomes more mature, um, the human factor there is probably becomes different and, and cost of capital matters a lot. Um, but in a market like it is today, I think it's very easy as a founder to go and optimize for a vanity metric of valuation. Whereas in the end of the day, what you're trying to do is you're trying to find partners in your journey to help you de-risk what is a very risky enterprise where a lot of businesses fail. Um, so I think my first piece of advice would be if you do go out and raise money, um, be very mindful about who you want to work with for the long term and be very mindful about what they will bring to you, whether they're angels, whether they're investors. Um, very early on, they should ideally feel almost like an extension of team members or people that are able to do a lot for you in, in very practical terms. Um, so that would be the first bit. 
Um, I think it lines up a bit with what Lucas says as well, which is that, you know, ultimately the goal is to build a business, not to, to kind of make tech crunch headlines. Um, the second one is, is very much about the teams you hire. I think there's a real skill that you see with great entrepreneurs around understanding what they and an early founding team can do. And when it's time to bring in someone else uh, who can build out a function, who can really drive something forward. Um, very often people will wait until something breaks to do that. Um, we see good people actually try to anticipate that and try to think through, um, you know, the business needs to grow 3x this year and a lot of that will involve a new channel. Let's proactively try to find someone who has the grit and the experience and the drive to go and build out that channel rather than to try and start building that channel and having to hire someone in a hurry and waiting three, four months until they can join. Thank you very much and, and thank you to all of you for joining today invaluable uh, advice there. Um, appreciate your time a lot. Um, I will now hand back uh, to the moderator uh, and look forward to concluding. Thank you. Thanks very much, Justin and uh, John, Lucas and Seb. Was some really interesting insights into VC um, and raising funding. Certainly been on that journey myself and thought there was some exceptional advice there that I wish someone had told me <laughs> at the beginning of my journey. Um, we're a little bit ahead of time, which is positive. Um, we've got a few questions in the q and I'm gonna hand over to Chris Moore, who's gonna answer those for us before we sum up the session today. Thanks, I, thanks Amy. And also thanks to Justin and, and the, the VC panel. I thought there was some fantastic learnings uh, and great experience uh, stories. Um, so that was really useful, I think, for the, for the audience today. So, uh, in no particular order, a few of the questions that we've had. The first one was about uh, why is the UK not promoting social networking companies? I think uh, when it comes to to promote different types of tech companies, uh, clearly the UK has strengths. It has strengths in a number of areas. Think of things like fintech and and technology for healthcare, but also in in technology for autonomous vehicles. Lots and lots. So I think um, we do from certain kind of themes and currently there's a lot of emphasis on uh, technologies or green, uh, clean growth. Uh, but if a company comes and we promote what it is that we do in the UK market, there's always a, a number of, of ways that we can help. Uh, sometimes that's uh, suggesting that they are a third party. So uh, like Rochester PR, for instance, who can certainly have help with those kinds of communications. But also sometimes it's engaging with the right kinds of networks and community would uh, uh, suggest that the, the company uh, begins to look for the right kinds of trade shows, trade activities, organizations. And as you go more towards the creative sector um, of which social networking probably falls, there are many other organizations that uh, we might want to bring in our colleagues from the creative team. But uh, if there are specific, uh, more detailed questions, then feel free to get in contact with DIT after the call. Second question was about um, registering a business in the UK and uh, uh, whether you'd want to operate the business, sorry, sorry, registering a business in the UK and then operating the business on a day-to-day -day basis in a lower labour cost country. Uh, we see lots and lots of companies who want to do this. So, for instance, there are companies companies that are based in markets like Ukraine or Romania or in uh, Southeast Asia that are providing software as a service or software development services. And in that instance, that's perfectly okay for a company to do that. There is no requirement for all of the, com all of the company to be in the UK. But what we do recognize is that many companies find it much in easier to engage internationally with customers if they have a significant base in the UK. That could be the HQ, that could be a European uh, headquarters, or it could just be a major part of the company. Because I think uh, uh, the UK uh, is well respected internationally and in certain kinds of sectors and certain kinds of markets, this is particularly the case. So again, uh, that's a, a more detailed, specific question that we can cover off on a one-to-one -one basis, but generally there are no issues about doing that. And the, uh, the third question was around um, uh, 
looking at whether you should have a subsidiary or a totally independent company. Now, um, as I think we heard from, from Alex earlier, and also I think we, we heard um, from Fran, sometimes there are reasons why you might want to create a completely separate independent company in the UK. But I think a lot depends on your business strategy. So where are your customers? How are you going to engage with your customer base? Do you uh, want to do that very separately from the parent organization? Are you, for instance, uh, applying your technology, say data analytics or AI to a completely different area? So perhaps looking at financial services rather than healthcare, uh, in which case that might prompt you to uh, establish a completely separate company. On the other hand, sometimes it's much easier to retain that linkage back to the parent organization because you may have use cases that you want to talk about uh, from the home market in, uh, in the UK. There may be other learning that you want to apply directly from the home market as well. So again, uh, it does depend on the circumstances and we can provide uh, suggestions and guidance uh, based on our experience with other companies. But ultimately, that is uh, a question you might want to talk to a uh, professional. So <laughs> talking to, to Alex, for instance, may well be very helpful to do that early uh, in your international journey. Uh, I think, Amy, that's, those were all the questions, unless there were others I've missed. No, that, that, that was it. Thanks very much, Chris. And uh, okay. a really nice way to sum up the session today. Um, we're a few minutes ahead of time, um, but I've, I've just, uh, the full session has been really enlightening, uh, especially listening to the, uh, the panel of founders that we've supported. And I think it just demonstrates, you know, the ease of doing business in the UK, the, the vast array of support um, to support the tech ecosystem and you know, the passion that we all in DIT and our commercial partners have for technology and business and helping people um, like yourselves to capitalize on those opportunities. Um, you know, we get up and come to work to do this every day because we actually really love it. Um, you know, and I know the guys on our team are, you know, really passionate about working with founders like yourself and, you know, just to reiterate, really knowledgeable, really good awareness of the entire UK tech ecosystem and landscape. And if we don't know it, we know somebody who does. Um, you know, like our commercial panel, uh, our commercial partners. Um, big thanks finally to the Venture Capitalist um, uh, Fund uh, uh, panel, just some really interesting insights there. And I think sometimes it's a really difficult space to navigate, especially when you're doing it first time at seed level, just understanding what it is you, you, need, to, you need to deliver to try and secure that funding. Thanks very much to everybody today, to our to Chris Moore, to our panel members, and to our commercial partners. I hope this has been an, an interesting and educational event for everybody involved. Um, you'll be able to access a recording, which will be shared to you post-event. Thanks very much for coming and have a great rest of your day.